Okay, and welcome back to the next overdubbed issue of <laughs> Open Studio. I cannot believe I forgot to put the microphone on for two episodes. So you only have to endure this one more time and then we'll be all set. <clears throat> okay, we, we, where we are at with this is a little bit reducer and it's black for this one. So what I'm pretty sure is going to happen here is that most of the work here is on kind of working out the details on that horn that's right in the middle. So get that started. Um, so yeah, the underlying colors in that are that blue and then that brown, which kind of pops up all over this painting. Um, so there's a little bit of black there, a little bit of that light blue. And if I'm correct, let's see if I am. Yeah, exactly. So it's the top side of the, the back of the housing for that horn. And the highlights on this thing are all that light colored blue. So doing is defining the edge on that just to get that set. And uh, that blue is a really good um, kind of base color for this. Just kind of blow that in. You could use the airbrush for this, but because that edge is so sharp, it just makes a lot of sense to use the, the uh, paintbrush for this. And it happens in a few spots across that. You can still see the HD stencil through very well. Um, so that helps to kind of make sure things are in the right spot. <coughs> However, with the uh, number of um, paint layers on there already, it gets kind of difficult to see what's going on there with the HD stencil. So I get to use the, the reference photo, which is on the tablet right there uh, as well. A little bit of both, but between those kind of works out well. You know, you kind of figure out where all the gaps are and how to fill those gaps in. Uh, the light is coming from basically where my hand is in the photograph. So with all that light blue is really going to eventually become the highlights on, on that horn, uh, on the sharper edge, and then on the edge of the housing there. So all that blue is getting put in there. The brown's already been started on that, which makes it easy. Um, normally I wouldn't have jumped on there, but I know I probably had it in the brush and just uh, painted some of that brown. And that's the brace that, or the, 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 uh, the mount that holds it on to the, um, the same part that actually holds the headlight on. So that's the highlight on the top of that. It looks like we're going a little bit darker now, so probably going to be, oh, okay. So the top of the springs needed to be cleaned up. Um, details go on first and then the airbrushing will kind of fill in the gaps, but the spaces between the springs and the top of that uh, mount and then the area that's kind of cut in there, um, keeps that a little bit sharper than it would have been if it was just airbrushed. There's a lot of shading in that goes on in that area anyway, uh, and I'm putting a little bit of texture on there as well to kind of give it something when I go to blend in that with the airbrush. Definitely more black. This is fun because I have no idea where we're going to go. <laughs> a lot of the decisions that I make, and it's still the same thing, it's cutting in a lot of those details, but a lot of the decisions that I make don't follow a specific plan. They more follow a habit. Uh, so I tend to do things overall the same way, but I will bounce around a lot. And that's mostly to just help me keep uh, engaged with something like this where it's it's very involved, you know, there's a lot going on here. So that just kind of keeps me interested instead of working on one aspect for too long. Uh, if I'm doing too much rust, for instance, you know, you just kind of get burnt out of that. You, so I will tend to bounce around a little bit um, if I find myself kind of getting numb to it. More of the same. So it's all about kind of cutting in those edges. The paintbrush does that really, really well. go. 
and then there's the bottom of that housing which also has that same pitted metal so again that kind of scumbling that in with the paintbrush really sets up that that pattern before I even get to the airbrush which is nice and the favorite burnt umber or that may be red oxide I think that's red oxide and there's a little bit of white there so that gives you that kind of orangey color and again more texture so the the lighter areas have have that lighter texture color because they pop out more they're out in the open a little bit more than the darker ones so when you blend all that together uh, they, it won't be as, as bold it'll just kind of blend in I feel, uh, you know, I've gotten beyond this point in the painting. I've actually recorded a couple other episodes, and the farther I go on, um, I feel like I still need to do some something to the springs. Um, a lot of decisions like that will happen even later on in the painting when I've got most of it done, and I kind of I'm looking around, and things aren't maybe, you know kind of gelling together right or something seems too harsh or too soft that kind of thing uh, and sometimes that doesn't pop up until later on in the painting and that's how I'm feeling about the springs now I know there's a couple little highlights that I missed but for the most part I think it needs something else we'll see about that as we go I should keep a notebook but I have pretty good nagging memory when it comes to things like that so I'll th be thinking about that through the whole painting till I fix it. And that is definitely burnt umber. Yeah, yeah, it's burnt umber. So a little bit of that in the red oxide, and that'll give me that rusty color. So I'm sure I'm going to, looks like, oh, yeah, yeah, just more texture on that top of that spring. That area there is really, really dark. Uh, so eventually that's going to have airbrushing on top of it. And the only way that that texture shows up, if it's if it's really like not bold, but it's complex and has some boldness to it, when you go to shade over that, if it's really subtle texture, it's going to get lost right away. So this works out really well with the, with the more, you know, bold colors. Now, it's easy to just put the dark color there and then just airbrush over it. But the underlying layers, that, that original color and then that red oxide color, really add a lot of complexity to it when you see it live. It acts like stained glass. So the uh, darker shading will be on top of that, but you really pick up those other colors that are in there. And uh, it just adds more depth to it. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. <laughs> Running to get a drink. No. Uh, I don't know. Saying something unbelievably profound, I'm sure. Earth shattering. Oh, airbrushing time. Okay, so I know this is going to be that burnt umber mix. So it's a little bit of burnt umber and opaque black and some 4050 and 4011 all mixed together gives me this neat shading tone for this the burnt umber really adds a lot to that rusty color the black the opaque black has a real brown cast to it anyway so i probably could have done that just with the black but it also has a blue cast to it as well so this eliminates that but you can see how dark that's getting and as that rolls along Again, it's difficult to see in the video, but in actual life, when you get up close to that, you'll still see those oranges and the red oxides in there. It'll just kind of really, it'll feel like something's going on under there. It's not just a, a void, you know. Again, surely something profound. In doing more of these now, I've become super paranoid about making sure that the microphone is on when I start recording. <laughs> so some good did come of it, which is great. 
I'm curious to see if I'm just going to wing it and put that color in and start darkening up the horn cover again or the horn because I don't remember what I did. So it's like seeing it for the first time. It's neat. And like I said, uh, there are so many ways that I could go. Let's see if this gives me a hint. Oh, maybe define the middle of that horn. That might be it too. I don't know if that was me needing a cutout, which would, which would make sense. So if I was doing a cutout, if I do want a cutout, if that's what I was doing, yeah, I am going to cut it out. So I would guess that I'm cutting out the middle of the uh, horn, the opening, and maybe some of the details on the um, on the housing. So, which are pretty defined there. You can see that in the cutout. I mean, in the photocopy there. Yeah, it's off the camera, but I'm sure that's what I'm doing. At least that's what I would have done. It's a very weird dynamic trying to figure out what you did. And I get so engrossed in what I'm doing. This happens more times than I would like, where the camera's zoomed in and I'm not checking the monitor and what I'm working on, you can't see. So, but like I said, I think when I pull that up, when you look at it, it's going to be the inside of the horn and maybe some of the housing that's darker. Yep, that's exactly what it was. Okay. So the reason why I do that, um, I could freehand that and get a lot of it in. This just makes so much quick work of it. Uh, it gives me that fairly sharp edge around the uh, outside of it, on the top side of it. The bottom where I'm pointing to right now, that fades. So what I got to do is when I spray this, I don't want to really hit that very hard along that edge. I want to hit it on the upper side of it so that it's dark where it should be. And then it lets me fade it where it, where it also needs to be faded. If I spray that whole thing like a stencil, like a letter stencil, it would take a lot for me to fade that at the bottom where that hard edge was. So I'm going to hopefully, if I did this right, I'm going to hopefully uh, kind of spray the top side of it heavier and then the bottom side where it starts to fade, I lighten up. Let's see what else I'm doing. Oh, I finally figured out that you can't see what I'm working on. There you go. Good job, Steve. So it's the underside, the darkest parts of the housing. And that just leaves the, um, it allows me to leave the, the screw heads that are there that holds the whole thing together. That just allows me to kind of keep them in place so I know where they are. So this becomes more of a place marker. Oh, this is going to be a good cut. This will be the money cut right here because I got to do it so I don't, cut the highlight out because then the whole thing will fall out. Oh yeah, look at that. It worked. Go figure. <laughs> so I left that as a flap because again, that's more of a place marker than an actual, you know, stencil. Like it's got to be there. And it should allow me to fix that little dig in the um, upper left hand side of that too. See if that's what goes on there too. I could take the curse out of that by mixing up that lighter tan color and just kind of touching on where the white is. Um, but something tells me that if it's dark enough, I'm just going to cover it with the shading. A jumbo magnet because that's all that works through the ampersand board. I have to get more of those. Uh, I never, you know, I didn't think I'd use very many of them, but I've been doing a lot more on ampersand boards than when I started with the magnets. So I think what's going to be a good thing to do is to get a number of those square and rectangular, mag rectangular magnets. Those ones there are extremely strong. Like if two of those snap together, it is a bear to get them apart. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy, but they stick almost perfectly on the ampersand board. So they have to go through that eighth inch ampersand board to the metal surface underneath and they stick through that board with the same, um, I don't know, not stickiness, but the same grab that the, that the regular magnets stick through paper. So that's nice. So I am talking about that dig. So let's see how I hit that. I think I'm just going to go for it. 
which is interesting because I don't know if I agree with myself here. <laughs> I think I might have taken the curse off that a little bit by painting it in tan, but the the, the whole bike is all beat up. So, oh, I'm not even going to touch it. Oh, okay, all right. Um, the whole bike is beat up, so even if that was there and you could still see it, it's going to look like a dent, you know, like a rock hit it or something. And then there you go. So that's exactly what I'm doing. So I'm mixing up a tan to kind of take the curse off that. So it might have been that I thought I might have been able to get away with it. But then kind of starting to throw that in, realizing that it wasn't going to cover. Because the other thing that happens with a white spot like that, so say I tried to cover it with the with the black, you know, that umber shading color that I was just spraying that's going to look different on the white than it does on the rest of it because it's got a white background behind it. So that's going to appear very sepia, greenish, brownish, where the rest of it's going to have this warmth of the tan underneath it. It's never going to go away. I mean, you could completely black it out. And then it would go away, but uh, not not very easily. So by doing what I just did there, I've kind of caught it back up, and now it's just going to be invisible. And of course, the other nice thing, again, the bike is all mashed up, so didn't have to be real careful. I didn't have to match it up perfectly. It just had to be close, so it's going to look like it's just, you know, dinged up and banged around and like the rest of the bike. And now I'm pulling down that shading onto the part that uh, doesn't have, you know, the mask on it. And again, that blend is much, much easier since I didn't hammer the bottom of that. I really left it all out. See, and you see how nice that blend is there? It doesn't look like it was done with a, with a template or a stencil. Now, the edge that kind of is the very center of that at the bottom, the bottom right-ish, that does have a hard edge because that's almost, it's either the entrance to that horn or it's the, the shadow of the ridge above. I'm not quite sure, but it doesn't really matter. But what does matter is that it's got that hard edge to it. So that's that's really what we want. And I'm, Let's see what we got here. Oh, okay, so I'm defining the outside edge of, of that horn cover. I keep saying horn cover because... I used to do with horn covers all the time. There was no cover for that, just straight up. It's no, it's also strange for me to watch this now. I, I like you, like all of you, I can't see the reference photo right now where I work with it. That's that, you know, the tablet there to the lower lower left. Um, what I really should do is figure out a way to do picture in picture again with um, the reference photo as well. Uh, that's going to be something that's going to be on the list. And as I do more of these, you know, I figure it out uh, and know what to add. And I think that's going to be a good thing. But what's interesting for me is I can't see the reference photo either. So my initial reaction to that line right there is that's way too bold. Like that's, that's not what it really looks like. Uh, however, knowing where this goes after this because again i've filmed a couple episodes after uh, I, I do know that 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 is the way that it is but for me now even having forgot really this this episode uh having done it a little while ago uh it was like wow that's probably not right but it is <laughs> there we go same thing that's a burnt umber black mix that's that's really the the color okay so to finish that texture in there it's just a little bit of uh, kind of scumbling. And what I'm doing my my glove there is I'm putting the paint down, but then immediately picking it back up. Some of it stays and it acts like a stain. So it has a it's much different texture than if I just leave the paintbrush stroke. It has a nice effect and it is, it's like a, almost like a water stain type look. Now the trick to that is, of course, you can't use a lot of paint because I'm getting it on the, the finger of that glove. If it's wet, so wet that it stays wet on the glove too, it's a huge problem because I'll be dragging that all over the painting. So you got to kind of get used to the dynamic of that. 
that is one of the other like the brace on the other side so that ultimately gets really dark right there but it also helps to find that horn and there's the top part of that housing too so that whole horn is all about concentric circles or in this case concentric ovals easily the hardest thing to paint on any of these pieces of technology so that will include headlights and wheels steering wheels anything that's that's oval but yet has another oval inside or outside of that same oval uh, it's it's hard to get those to match it takes you know kind of messing around with them uh, oftentimes if there's enough space between those ovals they're also in perspective which throws a whole other monkey wrench into it uh, it, it's always my favorite part, and by favorite part, I mean the least favorite part. <laughs> it's interesting because those concentric circles, even people without art experience can tell if it's wrong. You know, if a wheel, if the inside of the wheel, the rim of the wheel is not lined up and it's, you know, messed up from the outer edge of the wheel, it just looks like the guy curbed his car. So, uh, so it's always something that I wrestle with back and forth. This horn cover is no exception. The, again, I'm going to keep saying it because this bike is what it is. The saving grace for this whole painting is that the bike is so badly, not badly, it's so worn, so well used that someone would believe that that, that edge on that was not quite straight, that it got dinged or banged somewhere along the line. So in this case, it's not a brand new shiny bike that everything is mint and perfect on. I could certainly have some leeway with that and get away with it. And you know I will, so. Okay, running right around that edge. And again, it's all about the edges right now. It's a balance between the edges and the texture. So first is the edges to kind of get everything drawn in. And then it's to get the darkest part of the texture. The airbrushing is usually last, and I say that, but it isn't always true either. Again, it's a matter of self-preservation. If I've been doing a lot of line work and I just need a break and I want to mess around with the airbrush, there you go. So I know that there's more line work that could be done with that. So I'm pretty positive that's exactly what happened. So now it's softening all that line work. This is really thin too, the paint here. If it gets out onto the sidecar, you notice that the, the, the sidecar isn't masked off. If some of it gets out there, it's not a big deal again because of the rough, rusty texture of the top of that sidecar. So I'm not overly worried about that. If it, again, if it was a brand new bike and it's all nice and shiny, uh, then that, that you know painted, for instance, if it was bright red out there, um, I couldn't get away with doing that shading because you'd see that kind of brownish fuzz and that one that wouldn't work out so well so that with the airbrush here it's about getting that fade in but this is also to blend in that texture so if you notice what i'm doing is it's not a real smooth uh, application of paint there it's it's rough so there's it's it's specifically kind of scumbled in down here it's going to be smooth because that whole area there is is really dark but as i move up into the top part of it i'll change the the pattern of that spray so it's more like more cloud-like, if that makes any sense. So it won't be a real smooth, even fade. It'll start to pick up on some of that texture that's in there. What I'm doing right now is just painting on the outside of that screw head that's right there, which is interesting because that should have been paintbrushed too. Again, that screw is mostly in the dark, so it's going to be a lot darker than it is even right now, which is probably why I didn't paint it in. i got to connect the dots here and get up into that other little area there. That spike that looks good. There's a lot of blue in this too. This uh, whatever material, whatever type of steel that's made out of, 
Um, you saw that in the highlights at the beginning, but there's also a little bit more blue in the just the the whole thing really. So that that will come a little bit later too. And this is the the clamp that holds that on the bracket. There's a there's a nut and a screw and a washer that's right under the airbrush right now. And again, it's I probably should have painted that in with the paintbrush too because it's pretty defined. Uh, but again, I, I know I know what my brain was thinking when I picked up the airbrush. And I had enough of that for now. So we're moving on to uh, a little bit of airbrushing to keep things sane. I'll say it again, man. The best part of this whole thing is right now I'm talking away and not realizing the mic isn't on. Basically having an entire conversation with myself. I, what could go wrong? So here, that was a good example right there of putting in that texture. So it wasn't real smooth as it got to the light part. It was really just kind of like really gently back and forth with the trigger, the very front of the trigger to like let that paint sneak out and then stop. And it gives it that kind of rough, worn type of pattern. Probably do a little bit of that here, depending on how bright that is. But by the look of it, it's pretty smooth. So maybe I don't. We'll find out. Oh, the nut is there. I mean, the um, yeah, the, the nut and the washer is there too. So I believe that's the top of the nut right there below the area I just painted. And this should be the bottom of it here. And that should be the front, the face of it. Yeah, so I'm just kind of ghosting it around it. And that will be paintbrushed eventually because the, the lines on that, the separation between the washer and the nut and the edges of that nut are really sharp. So I'm just, I know I'm just kind of fuzzing it around it to, get it, get everything around it to the right value, but now it's starting to, the air is starting to uh, appear for you. And then back up onto the back side of the horn behind the bracket. With the airbrush too, I can kind of take some of the curse off that original light blue that I put in. With stuff like that, I always tend to put more of it in than I need because it's always easier to like cut it back in than it is to re-add it. So it's always nice, you know, add a little bit extra and then just be able to carve it back out. Then to have to reclaim it. Like if I if I didn't have it light enough or there wasn't enough of it there and I had to repaint the lighter blue there, I'd have to re you know do do it all over again essentially. You know, do all that light blue and then cut all the black back in. But uh, this way, it's just one step. Can you see how um, dark that lowest screw is now, right above the spring? So that's I, that's why I didn't have to uh, airbrush that one. I mean, uh, paintbrush that one. It's so tucked in there. It looks like it's freehand shield time. I wonder what this one's for. It's like a mystery to me, too. Um, I do love that shield. I know what I'm talking about now because I'm so lucky to have this. This is the anniversary edition of the Big Shield. So the Big Shield is, is actually a Big Shield. Uh, it was one of the original uh, Essential 7 from our tool. So along the way, it was the 20th anniversary of, of, that, um, of that template. They came out with two other sizes, this really small one, a medium-sized one, and then, of course, they had the big one. So I was fortunate to get my hands on that set. I love this template in all the sizes, but I especially love this small one. It is just, it's one of my favorite templates. And what's nice about it, too, is this one was uh, designed and invented by Gabe McCubbin, who actually started our tool. It was his company. So not only was the company owner, he also had one of the best stencils, too. They went on to make stencils for so many different people, and there are a lot of them are really, 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 really good. They're still around too. Uh, obviously, uh, they had a. Uh, they originally um, were selling their stencils with Iwata Medea, and then Iwata Medea ended up purchasing. Um, they had a really close relationship, and then they ended up purchasing the uh, templates and the production of them from Gabe 
So now they are solely with Medea, which is great. Still have all the same templates. I don't know if the anniversary one's still available though. So of course, while I'm talking, I'm not telling you what's going on, but I think it's pretty obvious that a curve needed to be straightened out a little bit on the horn and that was the edge. So that made a lot of sense to use a shield for that. I could have used a cutout, but the time it would have taken to cut that out again, um, just easy to grab a shield for that small section that's needed. And there you have it. So I promise no more voiceovers until I'm set up for that. So again, if you like this, please consider liking and subscribing and sharing this. It would be great. And um, I will see you guys all on the next one.